Good morning, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. It is still Shabbat on Saturday morning. Thank you very much for coming. Um, it's a, very, a great pleasure to have you here to uh, continue the colloquium weekend. Uh, Rabbi Moss and I are very excited to talk through the Torah portion of the week for you. It's sort of uh, heretical in humanistic Judaism or secular humanistic Judaism to actually look at the Torah portion of the week on the Torah portion of the week. <laughs> but it's okay. It's part of our library of cultural choices. We can't choose to do this even if we don't feel obligated to do it every week or for every subject. Um, so what Rabbi Moss and I worked out to do for this Torah portion, we're not going to read it word by word to go through it. But what I thought I would do to start is to give you a quick summary of what's in this section of the book of Genesis. Um, she and I will talk a little bit about some of the themes that come out over the course of these chapters. And then we'll open it up for comments and reactions and uh, other details in the story that are of note. So as you'll see on the board, the name of this Torah portion is Chaye Sarah, which means the life of Sarah, or you could creatively translate it as the lives of Sarah, uh, because of the ambiguity in the Hebrew grammar. Um, it covers uh, Genesis chapter 23, 24, and 25, most of it. Um, now the Torah portions, as you may or may not know, are not always named for what's in the Torah portion. It's simply some of the first couple words that appear in the Torah portion. Um, in this case, it marks the death of Sarah after the binding of Isaac story. And some commentators have speculated that the conjunction of those two events, the binding of Isaac story immediately followed by the death of Sarah may have some causative relationship. <laughs> if your son is almost killed by your husband, you may have some uh, negative health. Or not. There, may, there may be some negative, or maybe was killed, depending on the reading. Uh, there may have some negative health consequences. Um, so Sarah dies at the very beginning of chapter 23, and Abraham mourns for her and cries for her, and then he has to bury her. And so he looks to acquire a burial plot. Um, he goes down uh, Greenfield Road to Machpelah. No, he, <laughs> he buys the original Machpelah, um, which is clearly connected in chapter 23 to Hebron, which will become a very important city in the time of David. And also, of course, in modern Jewish history, we know about Jewish connections to Hebron and the tomb of the patriarch, which dates back to this, or these claims to date back to this story of Abraham purchasing a burial spot for Sarah. Uh, and he buys it from the Hittites who are in the uh, territory. In chapter 24, Abraham is getting older, and he decides he needs to find a wife for his son, Isaac. And so he sends his servant um, to go find a wife for his son. He says, I do not want him to marry one of these Canaanites living around and need him to marry from my clan, from my people. Uh, given one of the themes of the colloquium this weekend, being intermarriage and the experience of intermarriage, has a very close connection to uh, this text. Uh, most likely, of course, written centuries after Abraham, but reflecting the anxiety of the day that has always been part of Jewish life. What do we do with these outside people? So uh, he doesn't want I, uh, he doesn't want Isaac to be married to a Canaanite woman. He sends his servant back to his homeland, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the concept of what is your homeland. If he's now in Canaan, shouldn't that be his homeland? Because it becomes the Jewish homeland, but it isn't for Abraham. Um, and then uh, the servant goes back, finds a woman at the well. He prays for guidance. She shows up and does almost exactly what he prays for her to do. He um, talks to her first about a marriage and then talks to her family, and they work out a deal for her to come with him back to uh, Abraham's settlement. Uh, she agrees to go. Uh, interesting, they ask for her consent, and they talk about that a bit. Um, he then takes her back to um, Isaac. She sees Isaac from afar and uh, puts on her veil, and he sees her, and immediately it says he loved her, and he brings her into his mother's tent. And the idea of replacing his mother with his wife is also one that psychologists can have a field day with. <laughs> um, then in chapter 25, Abraham takes another wife. And I put the uh, family tree up here a little bit on the board. You'll see first you have Abraham who has a wife, Sarah, but she does not have any children. And so his maid, Hagar, is given to Abraham, and he produces a son, Ishmael, who will ultimately produce tribes. But that's not the core line of the Jewish people. Then Sarah has Isaac. Isaac ultimately will have Esau, which also branches off from the Jewish people. And Jacob is the line that continues to the 12 sons and so on. 
But Abraham finds a third wife in chapter 25. We don't hear about her very much. When you praise the matriarchs, she's not in the list. Um, Keturah ultimately becomes the mother of other tribes that are beyond um, the Jewish line. Uh, remember, Abraham is promised to be a father of many nations. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite lines in the Bible is where God promises Abraham, I will make you a goy gadol. I will make you a big goy. <laughs> Because the word goy means nation, <laughs> but uh, it just works ironically with Yiddish sensibilities and the use of the word goy. So um, the, uh, at the end of uh, 20, chapter 25, um, and the, as the Torah portion is wrapping up, uh, Abraham also dies, and his sons Isaac and Ishmael come back to bury him, which is an in interesting note. And the Torah portion concludes with the line of Ishmael, and it tells you his generations and the tribes and people that come out of the line of Ishmael. And the following Torah portion goes back to the main story of Isaac and his children and all of that dynamic that's more familiar to us. So that's a quick summary of the Torah portion, uh, Chaye Sava. And uh, so, Sivan, what were some of the themes that you noticed in the story uh, that you found interesting? Um, first of all, um, I, I love the idea that you started by telling the story because part of the theme of the story is about telling the story of what actually happened. Because the story is told more than once within the story. Um, it is told by the editor of the story, and then it is told by a character in the story. And we will talk a little later about the discrepancies or uh, what, what the points are. Why is it, why do we think it's done or what does it expose? Um, probably if I would tell the story of the parasha, uh, I would localize it. And I would say that it is a very dangerous uh, Torah portion. For us in Israel, it's extremely dangerous. Because what it does, it says there is this important place in Israel that is yours. And you need to make sure that you take care of it. It was bought, you know, with real money. There was the contract somewhere. Um, fight for it. Now, it happens to be in the territories. Problem. It happens to be a case where very few uh, Israelis live in that area. And a lot of soldiers have to take care of them. Which means that they endanger their lives. And if I want to localize it even more, my son is a soldier. <coughs> it becomes even the stronger issue. It becomes a horrible issue when you think about 10 years ago when this crazy guy walked in and killed 29 Palestinians believing that they should not be there, that he should be there. So we are talking about a bomb. We're actually reading through texts that influence our reality so strongly that how you read it is not a minor thing. How you tell the story becomes the focus of reading it. Being brought up in Israel, we read the Bible, you know, like you say, you don't know that you speak prose, so we read the Bible from kindergarten, not really knowing, not really realizing what it is. It's like a second language for us. It's not a religious book or, or anything. It's just so prevalent in our lives. Most uh, Israeli singers sing the Bible. Uh, many people don't even realize that they're quoting from the Bible, but they sing it. So lots of Israelis can actually sing uh, excerpts from the Bible, not, not really realizing. So. Part of it is, is these, um, what do you say, mokshim landmines that I find in, in reading um, this Torah portion. And the other thing in this Torah portion is a beautiful story of a man who is um, trying to think about the next generation. Now, it's not an idealization of this man, because he cares about the next generation, but he also, after Sarah dies, he gets married again and has six more kids, not one or two, six. He's over 100 when he has them, you know, good for him, but. <laughs> so, 
right. <laughs> uh, um, so this is a story about someone who is trying to determine the future by saying to the next generation how they should behave. Uh, let's stop for a minute. And, and for you, what would you... So one of the pieces I love, um, you mentioned there's the storytelling and the retelling, and then the servant tells the family something a little different than what actually happened, and uh, you called it a Rashomon. I would say it's like a Rashimon. Because <laughs> 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 it's uh, multiple versions of the story, but in a Bible context, um, and different perspective changing the story. But what I thought was interesting is there's things that are said and things that are not said. Um, one of the interesting parts of rabbinic interpretation of the Bible is this concept of midrash, where you can take the story and read in between the lines and imagine dialogues with characters or see things that are said or that are not said and as very important. The very beginning, the first verse is taken by the rabbis in a direction we might not. Um, the very first line says, Sarah's lifetime, Chaye Sarah, were 120 and 7 years. Now, the rabbi's interpretation of that is that when she was 100 years old, she was as innocent as when she was 20 and as beautiful as when she was 7. Ugh. <laughs> Actually, what I, from what I know about 20-year-old women, I would have said as innocent at 7 and as beautiful at 20. <laughs> but in any case, uh, that's their values being read into the text again, just based on the wording of that number. Uh, but there are a couple details that jumped out at me as something that isn't said but speaks volumes. Um, in particular, um, Isaac, uh, Abraham does cry for his wife, but when um, Rebecca is brought to Isaac, it says very clearly, Isaac loved her. And you don't get a lot of love in the early stories in the Bible, but the word is very clearly there, and he loved her, whatever that meant, because of course he then takes her into the tent of his mother. Which chapter? Is this is at the end of chapter 24. Um, the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah, and he took Rebekah as his wife. Isaac loved her, and he, and he loved her, and he found comfort after his mother's death. Now, whether she's a substitute mother figure or not, what does it mean that he, on first sight, he loved her? What, what kind of what kind of love is that? Is that you know mature romantic love? Is that knowing the soul of the other person, or is that Infatuation, what does love mean in this context? Is a dream, but it's just one line, and there's all these layers that one can pull out of it. And the, the last piece that I found really fascinating about what is said or is not said is at the very end of the Torah portion. This is in chapter 25, verse 7, after Abraham dies. This was the total span of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last, dying at a good, ripe age, old and contented. So before he was old and nervous, now he's old and contented. Uh, and he was gathered to his family. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah. Now those who remember the story of Ishmael, Ishmael might have a grievance or two against, against Abraham because after Isaac was born, Sarah became jealous and forced Abraham to expel the garden. He was somewhat reluctant, and then God said, do what Sarah says, send him away, and he did. And Ishmael suffered in the wilderness. And, it was a, not an easy experience, but yet at the end, at the end of the story, they come together to bury him. What did they say to each other? How did that dynamic go? Again, it didn't really happen in history. This is literary past. But one can imagine what isn't said here says as much as what is said. Um, I want to go back to, the, um, uh, to chapter 24, uh, the last four verses. Uh, or really the, the last five verses, uh, starting in 63. Um, I would appreciate if somebody would read from 63 to 67. Uh, you can read it in English. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in that case. And Anyone? Isaac went out. Thank you. And Isaac went out walking in the field toward evening, and looking up he saw camels approaching. Raising his eyes, Rebecca saw Isaac. She alighted from the camel and said to the servant, who is that man walking in the field towards us? And the servant said, That is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Isaac then brought her to the, into the tent of his mother Sarah, and he took Rebekah for his wife. Isaac loved her and thus found comfort after his mother's death. I find this such a beautiful 
poetic um, description of falling in love. Mm. Actually, she falls from the camel. Right. Just imagine, I mean, she sees this guy and she falls from the camel. The English says uh, alighted in the translation, like to get down, but the Hebrew is you pull, she... <laughs> she actually <laughs> falls. <laughs> and, the, and, and just imagine, I mean, she falls from the camel and then she just covers herself up. And so, first of all, I love it. <laughs> I think it's just brilliant to, in five verses, to show her feelings, something that's happening to her, um, sort of very unquiet, and then his reaction of falling in love with her, and, and it's poetry, it's five verses, that's it. The other thing which is very interesting is this whole veil issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're used to um, the concept of a veil having to do with uh, chastity. In other words, women would uh, cover themselves, do cover themselves, and um, the, the concept is that this is this is the concept of a veil in, in a wedding, and this is uh, the concept in the um, uh, almost all religions have the some port some uh, fashion of uh, covering themselves, um, but. I was reading through uh, something um, uh, Rabbi um, Benny Lau wrote. He's a, he's a, a religious, uh, an Orthodox uh, religious man, and we have a fascinating dialogue going on for the last uh, few years, which became even um, more interesting after we met. <laughs> the dialogue started before we met. And the reason it became interesting is that we both put on the table the concept of integrity. And somewhere along the conversation, I had one of these situations where he said to me, you know, come to Shabbat. In other words, come to Shul for Shabbat. And I said to him, how can I do that? I mean, you're, uh, this is about integrity. I can't even walk in the door and feel equal. And then we had this conversation about it, and slowly he started to realize where I'm coming from, and this is an a very interesting a dialogue that's continuing. I would have invited him to your house for your kind of Shabbat. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I'll say to that. <laughs> right. And we have an interesting uh, dialogue. It's on uh, YouTube. Uh, oh, it's in Hebrew. Okay. <laughs> Sometime we'll do, do subtitles to it. And you can see it. It's about Yom Kippur. Him asking me what's important for me. Yom Kippur, I'm asking him. It's an interesting. Anyway. <clears throat> He reminds us that um, the only other time that we have in the Bible this concept of a woman covering herself up is in the story of Tamar and Yehuda. Now, this is a story of a uh, woman who is now a widow. Her husband uh, just passed away. And being a widow is very bad in ancient society. And she needs to get married. And, is, and um, Israeli law says that she has to marry the younger son, if there is one. Yehuda, the father of the two sons, says, you know, black widow, one is enough. I don't want her to marry uh, the younger son. Mm -hmm. And she's desperate. She doesn't know what to do. So she goes out to the field in a place where she knows she's going to. Uh, Judah walks by in that field. And she covers herself up in a veil and disguises herself up as a whore. And he sees her and he has sex with her and she becomes pregnant. And um, uh, sorry, it's an important uh, piece in the story is that he doesn't have money to pay her. So she says, fine, leave me your, 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 right, your walking stick. Uh, I forgot the, how, how you say it. Uh, uh, um, which has an emblem of the tribe on the top of it. It's a very specific uh, kind of a stick. And uh, time passes by, and she ends up uh, uh, going to him with a stick, being pregnant. And he looks at her, and he says, you were right, I was wrong. And um, so the only other time is not about chastity. Yeah. 
It's about temptation. So, many times when we, when we talk about our Jewish culture, I end up saying, you know, Judaism is not what you think. <laughs> and it's just not. The veil in our culture has more meaning um, than just uh, accepting it as, as chastity. I mean, maybe you can think about this in a wedding and what can we tell the couples that we're working with uh, towards, uh, okay. But also, you can find other places in the Bible, like um, the prophet uh, Ishayahu says uh, about the, um, how uh, uh, important it is for the women to stop wearing these temptatious uh, um, disguises. That's how he treats the veils. So it's a very interesting concept. And now when you read our story, she falls off the camel and she covers herself up. It's a different read from what we were reading before. I remember seeing a picture going around on Facebook that had a picture of a woman in a Islamic chador, you know, a full cover veil, looking at a woman in a barely covering her bikini. And they're each thinking to themselves, how oppressed <laughs> of the other person, right? Um, because we talk about body image and um, you know revealing clothing and whatever else you want, and uh, sexualizing girls and all kinds of issues that come out of the opposite of veiling. Um, but at the same time, there are people who come out of veiling cultures or snoot uh, modesty cultures who tell of the horror stories of how problematic it is to live in a culture that obsesses over this. You know, if it's the woman's choice to cover or not to cover, it's very different than the society's imposition of covering all the time in any circumstance, in any place. Uh, I mean, you can see in a very sick way the end result of that culture in the uh, peeping rabbi scandal at the mikvah, where this is a culture that emphasizes modesty. He's not in the ultra-Orthodox world, he's more modern Orthodox, but still is part of the uh, ethos. And, uh, then, you know, what happens behind the scenes can be sometimes even worse than what might happen elsewhere. Um, what can I ask questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, did you have anything okay. else you wanted to say at the outset before we open up for... No, no we can we, open up and then we can interject. Great. Here that I don't Please. Understand. Okay. Unless this is disturbing. No. Go ahead. No, it isn't. Okay. So it says, the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done, meaning the servant was... Uh, saying, I'm trying to understand it, basically. So, what, in, in, in chapter 24, this is the telling of the story and the retelling of the story. So, as he's coming to this settlement, he says, God, I'm praying to you that if the right person is there, she'll come up to offer me water, and then she'll also uh, offer water to my camels. That'll be the sign it's the right person. So then she comes up and she does almost exactly what he asks her to do, and then he takes her to her family, he gives her some gifts, takes her to her family, um, and then he tells the story of the family about how she gave him water and also, also offered to water his camels, and he changes the order of things that he tells to the family. Um, so what this is doing is it's summarizing the whole previous chapter. He said what he had done. Summarizing that whole thing of traveling and finding the woman and doing the family and working out the deal and bringing her back. But what's interesting at that point is that they don't retell the story. You would wish sometimes in the biblical narrative they would do this more often. <laughs> and, and this is what happened. <laughs> read, you want to find opposite. out, read back, yeah. read back, right, opposite, exactly. See above. <laughs> um, but in this case, they summarize it in one. And again, it's that case of what's said and what's not said. How, how condensed did he make the story uh, to summarize it? Um, we, you know, we only have the one-line version here. Um, one of the other pieces that this indicates to us is this may be a remnant of an oral stage of transmission of the story. There's a lot of oral stories. You think about the Iliad or the Odyssey. There's both um, uh, collapsing of the story, but also repetitions where they'll retell the parts of the story. So and so said to so and so, go out and do this. And then he went out and did all the details. It's part of the oral storytelling style. And uh, this passage, by having this repetition of the story with slight changes, uh, may indicate at one time this part of the Genesis narrative had an oral transmission period before it was written down. Well, I appreciate that because all of a sudden you just have this sentence sitting there like a 
dead lock does. <laughs> <laughs> so m maybe we should. I've never seen a live lock. <laughs> no. So maybe we should Jumping do. <laughs> maybe we should do some of the um, actual reading to see how the story is uh, told uh, differently. So we start with um, uh, Genesis uh, 24, the first verse, um, which uh, I need help with reading here. So in English, uh, first verse, who's willing to read? Oh, right okay, go ahead. Abraham was not old, advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham... Okay, okay. Yeah. so okay. this is what we know about um, Abraham. We know that um, he is uh, old, he is um, blessed um, with everything. Now let's see in thirty same chapter, verse 35. And this is what uh, Eliezer, who is the uh, servant, who is the slave, he's not a servant, uh, um, what, he, uh, what he says. Is somebody willing to read 35 and 36? And listen to the description that he says about who Abraham is. Okay, 35, please. All right. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become rich. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore my master a son in her old age, and he has assigned to him everything he owns. Wow. Okay. Um, Again, Ishmael has a beef. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, why are we, why is Eliezer saying all of this uh, to the family? He's now talking to Rebecca's family, to Rivka's family. But he's selling. That's how shopping works. Right. He said, sorry? Look how wealthy they are. Good catch. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's, that's what he's it's saying. Okay, rich. so it's yeah. a bit different. Now let's look at um, 37 and 38. Now my master made me swear, saying, you shall not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. Okay, now let's go back to the beginning of what he said, what Abraham actually said, which is uh, uh, three and four. <laughs> and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell but we'll go to the land of my birth and get a wife for my son Isaac. Okay, what's the difference? No father's house. Oh, Sorry. from the Canaanites again. Mm -hmm. No, the Canaanites are in both, uh, are in both places, but um, in the first, uh, in the first not. thing that we read, my it's my father's house. Yes. Right. That's what's missing. And it's uh, interesting. I mean, this was his choice, not to... Not to call that, Nathan. Yeah, uh, you know, we're, we've been in this class on Saturday studying Jeremiah. And the very last three chapters of Jeremiah, he's, he has prophecies, bad prophecies, for all the related nations, including the Arameans. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the point is, he introduces, he's not a Canaanite which is totally unhistorical because the Hebrews definitely were Canaanites. They were actually, my father was a wandering Aramean mm -hmm. who happened to be there, mm -hmm. you know. He, so he introduces the Arameans as the real family, the real mishpacha. And the Canaanites don't, don't get a, a wife for my son from the people among whom I dwell, mm -hmm. the Canaanites. Which is an interesting concept, I think. I think it's also interesting the different emphasis between 24 and uh, later in 24, the beginning and the, in the middle part, mm -hmm. um, in, as opposed to the personal connection of Beit Avi. In mm -hmm. the beginning, it's Artsi, my land, Moladeti, mm -hmm. the land of my birth. And right. today, actually, people, Jewish people would say Artsi, my land, is 
Israel, Moladati, the land of my birth, or our people's birth at least, uh, they might say Israel. But for Abraham, the land of his birth is not the land of Israel because it's Canaan. Um, and so the question of what's your home, what's your homeland, what's your ideal home for us as American Jews? What is our home? What would it, you know? What is our homeland if we were picking one? Um, the whole question of are we still in diaspora, or is that an outmoded concept, as rooted as we feel in American life and culture? But, but the land of his birth is not Aram either. It's that's for right. Raised right. Raised right. Raised right. East. That's right. That's right. So it's two conflicting homelands for right. Abraham that's in, right. in the stories. Obviously. And there may be different traditions right. that have been woven together. No, and it's, and it's, it's, it's a. Um, um, find the, sorry. Go ahead. No, you're in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> what troubled me in terms of the difference was that there was absolutely no indication by the servant of the oath that he needed to take. Like there was a much stronger emphasis um, by Abraham saying, don't you dare. And then he's scared about that. He says, what if I don't? But none of that comes through in the story when he's telling it to the family. He's more concentrating on the sales element of it right. than the responsibility that he felt. He's well, probably so relieved well, you he wants want, to forget about that. You don't that. want the family to know that he doesn't have a choice. You see, if you go to a, a, if you go to a, a shuk, if you go to the shuk and you say, I must have this samovar, <laughs> and then you're going to pay through the nose. And if this is the only one he's allowed to buy, then, then he has a very limited leverage. So he doesn't want to emphasize the fact that I'm not allowed to buy anyone else but this, or acquire anyone else but this as a wife. Well, that's not going to help. That's cute. I never thought of that. And, um, and there's another uh, example in uh, four, uh, let's see if, this, if I'm right, um, yes, in, sorry, in 12, I'm still in the same chapter, okay, in 24, uh, verse uh, 12. Someone else want to read? Uh, sure. I mean, you all know English. <laughs> all right. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, grant me good fortune this day and deal graciously with my master Abraham. Okay, so basically what is he saying before we read the parallel one? What's he saying here? That's Abraham's God. That's right. Right. That's right. Here there's an emphasis. Abraham. And be kind to him. Give him what he needs. In okay. other words, let me fulfill my job. Okay, and there, there is a chesed. How do you say chesed? Kindness. 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 Yeah. Okay, so that's, there's an emphasis here. And let's look at 42. Right? It should be 42. <laughs> I came, okay. I came today to the spring, and I said, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you would indeed grant access success. to the success. success to the errand on which I am engaged. Isaac gets access to the errand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 44. No, he's praying for himself here. And who answers, you may drink, and I will also draw for your camels. Let her be the wife whom the Lord has decreed for my master's son. So, what do we have in this version? We talk about there is both the success concept, which is new, and the other, there is the proof. Yes, um. In other words, I told you that this woman will do such as, uh, will behave so and so, and here she's behaved so and so. So we have the proof that um, uh, the story um, uh, preordained. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, and and then there there are two other uh, uh, parallels that, that we can point out. But basically, it was important to to suggest what we started with is that uh, telling the story is about what you want to say. And. Um, and just, it was bugging me ever since it was read. Why did he say to, uh, to Rivka that Isaac was his master? Isaac is not his master. Abraham is his master. Mm -hmm. Why didn't he say, my master's son? 
sorry, it's just... Where, where do you see Isaac as a friend? It's right at the end of 40 uh, When she comes and he, she, yeah. she yeah. says, who is that? And he right. says, he's like my master. master. Oh. oh. Possibly, like in many uh, families and slaves, the, everybody in the family is the master. Right. I think so. It's understood. I don't think it's a question. Of, uh, the men, anyway. The men, right. Yeah. The men in the family are the masters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it kind of touches on the concept of slavery. There's a reason why the Bible, the, this translation, uh, sometimes the word evet is translated as slave, and sometimes as servant, because they have a hard time with the concept of, of slave, you know, uh, you know, and to say that slavery is good in the 20th century when this was translated was not so, you know, so PR. Yeah. But um, Eliezer is more than just a slave. He, it says when he introduces him, when he just mentions him, he is in charge of everything that is in Abraham's household. He is a, an important person in the household, not just a common field slave. Um, I think it's a, it's a, thank you for pointing that out. I think it's very, very important. There's a very um, interesting book that came out by uh, Professor uh, uh, Pina Galpaz Feller that um, talks about the question of. Uh, story or versus reality in the expulsion from Egypt uh, story. And she focuses quite a bit about this concept of avdut, uh, of slavery. Now, uh, in Hebrew, the same root is used for work. In other words, avodah, avodah and avdut. And uh, one of the thoughts that um, uh, she exposes, she's not the first one, but she sort of does it in a very interesting way, and then she said, maybe our concept of what slavery is, is wrong. It had to do with work, very much like what Joseph does in Egypt. He is basically a slave, but he's not. He's responsible for the whole household and for all of Egypt. He's second to Pharaoh. So maybe there's something uh, 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 different in the concept that we think of slavery. We're talking about people who work. And different from what they usually work in the, uh, the slaves in Egypt, the workers in Egypt, had it very hard because of what the Egyptians did to them. They made it even harder for them. But maybe that's not what everybody who was a slave, maybe that's not how they lived. It, these were very uh, hard times. And to have any job, uh, even slavery, was something that uh, may have been considered uh, during those years. So. That's what she talks about. But anyway, you're, you're, I think you're accurate that the, what does it actually mean a slave is something that we need to um, think about and not take for granted that we understand what it is when you read. I think the Barbara now said it. that uh, slavery meant simply that they were not paid for in uh, money or objects for what they did, but that instead they were being kept. In other words, they had their safety, right. their children, their wives, were also fed and they had a place to live. But they had no choices. Yeah. For instance, Hagar, who is a slave, was given away. Yes. to yes. Abraham. Yeah. This is there not... Was an ownership issue. Yes. But so was the act. She was given. That's true. She was, nobody asked her. She was given by her father. Yeah. Family. Mm. Well, the line between... Look, uh, the morning blessing in traditional Judaism is thank you, God, for not making me a goy, for not making me a woman, and for not making me a slave. And those are all thought to be of similar semi-full human status. I mean, they're not fully autonomous and independent. Um, daughter's vows can be annulled by parents. I mean, there's all, there's all kinds of categories where women and slavery in traditional Jewish thought, they were not the same, but they were not as different as they should have been. I wanted just to mention back to talking about uh, Ketura. First of all, I think it's an interesting uh, thought that um, Ketura, the uh, third wife of, uh, of Abraham who bears him six sons, uh, became the name of the uh, reformed kibbutz in Israel, which is an interesting choice of, uh, of the name. But um, it also doesn't mention her pedigree. Uh, it, yes, and it's, it, it also is interesting that it says here that um, uh, Abraham 
uh, bequeathed his heritage, his, uh, not heritage, his uh, yeah, inheritance, 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 or estate, yeah. to uh, only Isaac. And after that comes the focus that you say that Ishmael and Yitzchak come uh, to his burial. So it's an interesting, uh, yeah. like, like I didn't do enough, now I'm only giving him the inheritance and he still comes. But maybe he came because he thought that he could get someone here. <laughs> I mean, he's been away all these years, and suddenly his father dies and he shows up. I, I don't know if they have probate court. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and when you come to would... embarrass everybody else because you've been left out. And say, so you show I'm up here, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's a fulfillment. Because when they're, when they're <clears> in <throat> trouble, with his, when he's out of starving or running out of water, God comes and says, no, the, you know, everything's going to work out. This is all done for a reason. And then he becomes the father of 12 great nations. So it kind of all works out for him. It's not like he's, he doesn't get his father's inheritance, but he got some. He's you know, doing okay. He got, yeah, he's doing fine. He's doing well. He got oil. And he, and maybe <laughs> he told him, well, this was all done for a reason. And the father was just, was just doing what God told him to do. I, I don't think that investment would pay off for quite a long time. <laughs> would you? One of you say a few words about I'm, um, I'm interested in the easy acceptance of uh, polytheism in this time. That you know it, you know there's a lot of gods around. This one is Abraham, so that's the one who's going to take care of Abraham. So my God, but you know I could ask it for favors for Abraham. It, it was it's so it's just passed on by as if it's a completely normal thing. Yes. And yet, there's, you know, a few centuries later, there's this um, complete panic about anybody believing in any other gods. Or, or talking to any other gods. In fact, yeah. the word is used to go whoring after other gods. And yet it was just, it was so easy to talk about at so that our, time. It's so our obvious. challenge is that for centuries we've translated the proper name of the god with the Lord. Right. Instead of Yahweh, Yahweh, Zeus, give him a name. He has a name. He has a proper yeah. name. And if you refer to him by his proper name, Yahweh the God, then it would be much more mythological, but it would also make more sense in the dynamic of the story. In fact, sometimes you'll see the phrase, the Lord God, in the English, which stands for Yahweh Elohim. Amen. I often render that as Yahweh of the gods. El God. Mm -hmm. but it's the El oh, that's cute. No, no, no. It's Yahweh of the gods. But it's El was the Elohim. chief of the Mesopotamian I know that, but Elohim is not the same as El. So the, yes, the point is, is that God. it's from the same root, but it's, it's a plural form. Yeah, plural. So Different the challenge right. is, mm -hmm. uh, because the story has been rendered into English with this generic the Lord, as if it's the one God of all the universe, and what's he doing playing favorites with Abraham doesn't make any sense. If you go back to the original style of, this is Zeus the god of Abraham, this is Yahweh the god of Abraham, then it seems to flow a little bit more comfortably. But you're absolutely right about how later generations reading this are going to impose their values, their monotheistic perspective, and make it fit. <laughs> the best example is in the Exodus story, the song at the sea, where Miriam dances with her timbrels and sings, Mi kamocha be'elim, who is like you among the now, the English <laughs> always translated as the mighty, <laughs> but Elim is the gods. But later generations couldn't accept that, so that's why they fuss with the translation, and we're stuck with their um, preoccupation. Yeah, Harold. I'm a little bit uh, puzzled by this uh, focus on Ishmael's intention. Isn't the real question the author's intention? You know, who, wrote, who put this story together and re the redactor, and they may have thought having Ishmael return would show a sign of reverence that these people are still children of Abraham or something. It's not, for it seemed to me, anthrop true. anthropomorphizing this story more than I would expect. Well, we're not, we're not treating them as real people, we're treating them as real characters. So if you can ask what Hamlet's motivation is, you can ask what um, Little Red Riding Hood was thinking at a certain point in the story, <laughs> then we can, we can also explore Ishmael's motivations in the literary frame. Um, but I think it's a good point to offer that this, these are written in a historical context with political agendas happening as well. It's not an accident that one of Keturah's children is the Ashurim, which become the Assyrians. And you're right, that by connecting all these peoples to Abraham, it's elevating the importance of Abraham as the father of all these nations, the Avraham, the elevated father. 
uh, I'm sorry, the father Big of many. Daddy. The father mm -hmm. of many. Avram is the elevated one, and then Avraham becomes the father of many, which is proven by all his kids coming back. Um, and, of course, we know the favored line of this father of many is the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, us line. Mm -hmm. So it absolutely has a political agenda orientation to it as well. It's just another way to look at it. There's a traditional saying that there are shivim panim la Torah. There are 70 faces to the Torah. That means that everybody is going to read it with different lenses and angles, and you can do a historical reading, you can do a literary reading, you can do an ideological reading, you can do a feminist reading. There's a book that came out uh, this last year called Torah Queries, which offers a, a queer that is a LGBT-oriented uh, approach to the text and reading it through that lens. They can exist simultaneously. It doesn't have to only be one way to do it. Um, just another note about uh, the gods in the Bible. Um, th th there is no, I don't think that today there is any researcher who would say um, different, that um, there are many gods um, in the Bible and there are many um, <coughs> idols in the sense of sculptures of gods that are part of the legitimate story. Uh, for example, when um, after the 14 years that Jacob worked, to marry Leah and uh, Rachel, they uh, leave uh, their home. Um, and uh, on the way, uh, their father uh, decided it was a very bad idea that uh, they left. And he uh, runs after them. And one of the excuses for, for running after them is that he uh, says to Rachel, you stole my idol. Uh, she, he doesn't say to her. He says to Yaakov, uh, you stole my idol, you stole my God. That's what he says to him. And, uh, and Yaakov says, you know, not me. I didn't. So he walks into, he probably knows his daughter very well. And he walks into the tent and he, he says to her, Rachel, you know, uh, uh, where is the statue? And she says, I don't know what you're talking about. And he says, well, get up. And she says, I can't. I am in this period of the month. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't. But we know she, she couldn't leave home without, without it. <laughs> and it seems just natural. And that's not the only story. It comes again and again. So this was very much part of the reality. And the fact that there are different stories and different ideologies just probably show us that uh, is, uh, Judaism was always plural. I have a question. So, if the translation is Yahweh, the God, one of the gods, so when did somebody start translating it as the God? Was that the Greeks? or Who did that? Well, so one of the challenges is the word Elohim is a plural form in the Hebrew grammar, but it very often takes a singular verb. The first line of Genesis, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning created God, just an inverted order, but the created is a singular, not a plural. So there are a couple ways to think about it. One is you could think of it as a collective singular, like the gods, the divine powers, that unity of many pieces make a single decision, like the United States is, as opposed to the United States are, which is what it used to be before the Civil War. Um, so that's one way to approach it. Uh, but again, it's been read through a monotheistic lens since uh, the return from exile from Babylonia in 500 BCE. So uh, there's been a, a long history of taking this as this has to mean God, um, and this has to mean the one God of everything. Uh, so we're we're sifting through fragments to find the the real history or the archaeology that will show I idols or show Yahweh as one of part of the gods of Canaan. Um, in Canaanite culture and literature, we have examples of that too. Um, there's a, another character, very intriguing, named Asherah, who is a goddess in the Canaanite pantheon and may, and may have been uh, the fertility goddess that was Yahweh's consort. We found an inscription. Um, I forget the name of it was found. But, yeah, right. It has Yahweh and his Asherah. Um, but, you know, it's a heresy for the Orthodox, but uh, interesting like for us. Okay. Yeah, talking about intermarriage. Right. <laughs> Even, even Yava married a Canaanite. <laughs> yeah, well, that's part of that's a promo for my speech. I wanted to show you something. I wanted to show you something about um, uh, Yahweh's name, uh, which I, I've shown it to some of you in the past, but I think it's a, it's important. 
Uh, in Hebrew, when you say uh, present, usually you add another verb, but when you say present, you say hove, okay? And when you want something in the future, you add a yud to it, okay? So basically, yahave is um, the, the present will be. In other words... Uh, Process thinking, of becoming. Becoming, mm -hmm. uh, right. And um, it is, uh, I think, very unfortunate that the name was not allowed to be used because it is such a smart and unique name to name an entity that you have absolutely no, uh, no control over, which is time. And this talks about how fluid the present is and anything that can be that is already the future is ever changing and that the idea of having a, a deity that is this a, a amorphous time is such a wonderful concept that people are not aware of because you don't say the word so y yeah. you don't see the intricate um, sensitivity and, and uh, I think genius of, of, of the writers one other comment related to time, both because our time is running short for the class session, but also um, you remember that one of the themes we highlighted was how Abraham is getting old and he's advanced in years and he's worried about what's going to happen to his son, what's going to happen after him, and then later on it says he was old and contented, he was happy with how it turned out. And one thing that Sivan and I talked about in preparing for this class session was there's a traditional cycle for every Torah portion of what's called a haftarah. It's often called a half Torah, as if it was half the Torah, which is the Ashkenazi pronunciation, but it means the additional piece, the half, the half tier is to add. So um, the half Torah for this Torah portion is chosen by rabbis with particular orientations, but we might have our own half Torah, our own sources that we might bring into this, and not only from later in Tanakh, but maybe from later literature as well. So as one example, um, I remembered a passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Um, well, I remembered it was in Ecclesiastes, and I looked up and found out that it was in chapter 2. Uh, and the passage is about a man who looks at all that he's done in his life, and supposedly Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, was written by Solomon at the end of his life. He wrote the Song of Songs when he was young and randy, and he wrote the Book of Proverbs when he was mature, and then he wrote Ecclesiastes when he was old and bitter. So Ecclesiastes um, says, this is... Um, in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 18, uh, just listen if you want. So too I loathe all the wealth that I was gaining under the sun, for I shall leave it to the man who will succeed me, and who knows whether he will be wise or foolish. And he will control all the wealth that I gained by toil and wisdom under the sun, and that too is hevel, vanity, futile. And so I came to view with despair all the gains I had made under the sun. For sometimes the person whose fortune was made with wisdom, knowledge, and skill must hand it on to be the portion of somebody who did not toil for it. That too is futile and a grave evil. For what does a man get for all the toiling and worrying he does under the sun? All his days, his thoughts, are grief and heartache. And even at night his mind has no respite. That too is futile. <laughs> this is the story of someone who built a family business. And his son is a nebbish, and is going to ruin it and drive it to the ground. And <laughs> this, is the, this, is, this is the fear of what might happen when you can't control the future, you can't take it with you, and you're going to be leaving this legacy to someone, and who knows what will... That's the, that's the anxiety of Abraham at the beginning of this part of the story. What's going to happen? I, it says I was successful, but what's going to happen to it, and what's going to happen to my son? And the counterpoint to this, the other text that I would bring, is a passage from Yehuda Amichai's uh, poem, I Feel Good in My Trousers, which is in our anthology, Judaism in a Secular Age. And he says, in essence, that my life is limited. I don't have control over everything. Maybe I'm the scraping from the pot bottom, I'm not the, the, the cream of the crop. But I feel good when I'm alive. I feel good in my trousers. And my favorite line of the poem uh, is he says, I feel good in my trousers where my victory is hidden. <laughs> uh, my victory is oh. <laughs> because what's his victory? His victory is the power to make life, the power to have a future, even beyond his own life. So if fate is cruel, if life is limited, we have a victory, and that victory is the power of life. 
Um, and that's where Abraham at the end feels comfortable that life will continue, even his own life and giving of life has continued. Uh, and his victory is now uh, around for us to see. There's some wonderful Mepharshim that talk about Isaac and who he was and what he was really like. And of course it's Midrash, so they're making it up. But, you know, some say that he was really gay, that he was not very competent. Or slow. That he was slow, that the trauma, that he had post-traumatic stress disorder, okay. that he wasn't really able to function. And then when she fell off her, the camel, when she saw him, um, it was partly in sorrow that she learned to feel that he was a good man, but it, partly in sorrow that she was such a vibrant woman and he was a dullard. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we were looking together at uh, Ecclesiastic, <laughs> um, and I remembered uh, another verse which, uh, which I love, which I take from, uh, from that. And that is um, in uh, chapter, what is it, 3, uh, 22. Kohela? Uh, yes. Um, I don't know if you can read because my translation sure. is very bad. Uh, 322. I saw that there is nothing better for man than to enjoy his possessions, since that is his portion. For who can enable him to see what will happen afterwards? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that really talks about Abraham. The only thing in the translation which is uncomfortable for me is that it's not about possessions. It's about his part in life. Zechelko, not his possessions. And I saw that yeah. in his deeds, because this is his part. And it's not possessions. So it's not yeah. possessions. The deeds, what he's done. Yeah, it's yeah. what he's done. And I think that you know, if Abraham could have looked at uh, the end of his life this way, <laughs> then um, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a better send-off <laughs> than what we gave him. We actually uh, use this in, when we do humanistic teachings to say that it's your deeds that live on. Your mm -hmm. immortality is in what you do and accomplish and impact. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming. I thought this was a very stimulating study session, uh, both with what you brought and what we brought. It's finished um, already? And it's, well, we started 10 minutes late and we, <laughs> we're, we're done for today. We can stay and chat those who want to. Um, I have to run around and set up things, but that's my job. As you recall, the colloquium starts this afternoon. The book table opens at noon. Um, if you want to browse now, that's, you're certainly welcome to. And the session starts at 1 o'clock with Rabbi Ma speaking about the dynamic of in intermarriage in Israel, um, and then at 2.30, Karen McGinnity will speak on uh, the gendered experience of intermarriage, uh, then we have a break for dinner, and back at 7.30 for the ordination of two new rabbis who are in the room, Susan Opperbach and Ed Klein. Uh, we're very pleased to be able to celebrate their achievements with them. So it's a full afternoon and evening, and then we'll pick it up again Sunday morning, 10 to noon, uh, with post-denominational Judaism and my thoughts on the whole thing. So, uh, thank you very much for coming. And